Forge the Narrative. Hey everybody, welcome to Forge the Narrative. My name is Paul Murphy, your host. We are the Battle of Souls podcast. I'm joined tonight by Chris Morgan. The dynamic duo. <laughs> hey Chris, thanks for joining me. Yeah man. Got a lot of stuff coming up. Uh, got the Louisville Slugger coming up. That is uh, June 9th and 10th in Louisville. I mean, I know I've said it before. It is called the Louisville Slugger. So you can figure out where it is. <laughs> yep, for sure. I mean, and are you giving away a Slugger as, <laughs> as one of the prizes? Oh, if we could find one. If, if Dude. we could find one. We are going to have some cool prizes. This is going to be the first time that you can get uh, the FTN trophies produced by Shapeways. Is going to be at the Louisville Slugger. Oh yeah, that's I'm I'm excited for that. That's cool. Those yeah. are those are real neat looking. Oh, they are. I'm gonna try to try to paint them up too, and then uh, we'll do some more spots with Shapeways about that whole process about how it was created and uh, and how people can get their their imagination into something physical, which you know even two or three years ago I don't even think was possible. Yeah, I would definitely say it's with 3D printing on the rise. I mean, at Adepticon, I picked up a 3D printed robot for my boy. You know, and, and having, having that accessibility and just like, it's, it's cool. There's, there's no version of this that isn't cool. Yeah, I, I agreed. The other big tournament is the ATC. So that's the five man team tournament. Uh, one of the largest tournaments in the world. There's going to be tons of teams there and 500 people playing 40K. Yeah, that's, that's a big party. And other stuff. Underworld Shadespire is going to be there. They're doing a Sigmar team tournament. I mean, this is a, it's a massive event. They've, uh, they've, they brought it out, I guess, uh, extended it to a full three days. Uh, so, oh, man. Like, yeah, so it, it's, I mean, uh, Shane and Chris, uh, those are the two main organizers of the event. They do an amazing job. It's, this is, I mean, I can't remember if they're sixth or seventh year, uh, but it is something that I look forward to every year. And that's coming up in July. Uh, I think that's July 14th and 15th, if memory serves right now. Well, you know, we, we talk about ATC every year on the show. And, it I mean, it sounds like it's getting bigger. And uh, it was already it huge. Yeah, it, it is. So those are the two main things I've got, uh, I've got coming up and I'm most excited about right now. And the, the Louisville Slugger is something that we are hosting, FTN, uh, along with the Bourbon Brothers there. They, they, uh, they are some of the ones responsible for the scene being active and thriving in Louisville. And I'm, I'm also writing the missions for it, like even as we speak. I've got three missions done right now. Going to be two more. It's a five round tournament. You know, I wanted to, to wait until we, we saw the fact, the big fact come out, uh, in case that was going to change the, the dynamic of, of the game and how, what most people take. Cause that's really what you, you know, I'm a big believer in the fact that you can, you can balance the game through mission, uh, design and point limit. You know? I'm a believer in the fact too. Uh, wait, maybe that's, not what you meant (laughs) but no i was actually just gearing up to ask you like how different does your mission design feel post faq Uh, like yeah what what are the things that you you had to think about differently uh that, that is a good question and i think it's it's fortunately very subtle uh, and then I like to play uh, to, to more of an aggressive style. So the missions are about things like killing, uh, p- exposing yourself to, uh, to potential extreme strike backs and, and that kind of, but all in very fun. It's, uh, you know, it, it plays into what, uh, what eighth edition is all about. These missions will. And I think the, the FAQ helped hone that even more like what the the intent of eighth edition is and so i think it, it kind of goes hand in hand with the idea of that to make these missions uh to give an enjoyable environment for a weekend of gaming very cool yeah and it's not that uh, and it's just just a, a different way of playing you know the, there there are lots of strong mission sets out there right now and even the main rule book have uh has um wrapped in some elements that have been out there in the tournament scene for a long time and the so progressive objectives and stuff like that um if you if you want to hear the sound of someone tooting their own horn <laughs> i always i always count on you for that i'm very proud of the fact that they've they worked <laughs> their way in and on the also they were in the uh horse heresy books too in the, in the mission in the missions definitely yeah and, and it's it's very interesting too because the way that i would say both of us like to play is we like to play up close and personal and, and in your face Except when you're bringing three mana cores, but uh, you know that's that's less up close and personal. But <laughs> e- even even so, like with with your missions and with you know a lot of the concerns that people are having online have to do with, well now it's Gunline 40k again, which might be a bit premature. Maybe it's just you know uh, Assault is now turned to and on 40k. We'll see. But when you're designing those missions, are are there things that you're doing to try and get people 
up close and personal, like cl- closer. Well, not gun line. I shouldn't say uh, not gun line. Gun line. I want every. The idea is to have every army be viable, but th- be, to present different challenges. Uh, to where if you're if you are facing just what is your your polar opposite, your worst absolute matchup then maybe you can play the mission and you can still do well in that round. You can still win that round. And, and that's what uh, that's what I think the mission should encourage is not just uh, non-interactive 40K. You want, I, what, I, what I want is interactive 40K. I, yeah. I think that's what everybody really wants too. And that's, I know that's the intent behind the FAQ in general is that they saw a group of people who were just like, turn one, my opponent goes first. He has a great game and I just pick up models, you know, that's that's kind of the mentality that they talked about on their live stream. And so, you know, missions are kind of the only way that we still have to kind of take control of what happens, at least if people are playing it. Right. Yeah. And and I believe you publish that stuff as soon as you possibly can so people can view them, uh, make if they want to make any changes to their list, if they if they want to include one, one more unit of deep strikers or one less or whatever, you know. Uh, that's the kind of thing that you want people to know in, in as far in advance as possible so they don't show up on tournament day and be like, oh, what do you mean I can't, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to do well in mission three. If I'd just done something different, I would have <laughs> would have done all right. Yeah, we want people to bring hard lists, too. We just want people to be able to enjoy the game more yeah. with the stuff that they like to play versus what they feel they have to play to to uh, to win all the time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and your question is like, what what's the mindset? It is just how do you encourage uh, that interaction? Uh, that that what 40k is is about the core concepts: taking and controlling, eliminating models, making it seem fresh and uh, and and really enjoyable. Really, because because you're going to be playing some hard games, like especially if you're in contention for for winning one of the major awards, you, you're you're you might have some some tough games. But how do you make it fun? And that's that's really what mm-hmm. this is all about. Oh, you got to get you got to make it fun for as many people as possible, too. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. So those are the main concepts, and it, you know, and so the, the FAQ, the big, the big fact, did kind of like zero down, get get more honed towards the intent, like we just talked about. But so, but it's, it, but it is kind of subtle outside of those big changes that seem to really be directed at Blood Angels. <laughs> Oof, you, you hit you hit close to the heart. I know. I I, I could I couldn't make it through uh, without saying something about it. But but it, we are we're uh, past those types of changes. The other changes are all either clarifications of intents of things or just restating of what they, what it said in the rule book before. But then, you know, that rule of threes is a, is a, is a huge change. I mean, the, I know plenty of people out there with, a, with four mana cores that they were taken in, in a detachment or, you know, four units, dark reapers, for instance, uh, yeah, you know, high fleet hive tyrant is out of business. Uh, yeah. Oh. Uh, and, and so that does shift things. And so you don't have to plan for those. So, and that goes, that goes both sides. It's in the mission design and your own army list. Like you don't, you don't have to plan. You know, uh, Martarion is not going to die in round one of every single game you play anymore. Uh, if he does, it's going to take the majority of your opponent's army to do it. And if he dies to the combined might of the entire enemy army, he's still kind of doing his job because everything else that you have in that list that does work is, you know, unscathed. Yeah, moving up. And you've got to factor into the fact that a lot of people are going to, uh, like, enjoy the fact that they have a round to assume board control. And, and right. that's something to think about, uh, with missions, whether you, whether you want to reward that or whether you want to make that more challenging, um, to, to, to where, how big of a fact, how, how much you want that to play into the result of the game of people just wanting to do that. Yeah, you know, I've, I've been trying to take the, the Bear Grylls ap- approach to, to list design, you know, improvise, adapt, overcome. <laughs> As a <I> drink pee. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like you have to, honestly, <laughs> if you're staying pure, pure blood angels. I've been brainstorming a lot. I have a an article that's going to come out in Frontline that's about that. Just kind of brainstorming what 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 things I need to do now with my pure BA list. And you know, I you know, I, I've said it before. I like the the pure faction lists, and I accept the limitations that come from that competitively because that's that's kind of the standard I judge myself by. But it's it has been fun, and it's been enter- entertaining and exciting to kind of open up these different options I hadn't been considering before. And I, I hope that we can see a lot of that moving forward with the different list design. I, I think we will. And it's going to be uh, interesting to see these brand new codexes that are coming out uh, and and how to approach them with what is this now 
I hate to say modern with the game being as young as it is, uh, but this new mindset. Yeah, it's it's a living rule set. You got to kind of you know come in with the uh, with the tide and leave with it too. Uh, you know, I think that it will settle down though. I think that we're starting to see a little bit of um, of change fatigue. I don't know. That might just be because we've had a couple weeks of Sigmar. <laughs> I I don't know. I think I think that. Uh, that the idea of, well, you know, you're fact proof if you just don't exploit things. Well, what is an exploit? You know, like that's relative. It, it really is. Uh, I think that we're, we're, we're starting to experience like a little bit of, ch- of change fatigue. But I, my, my answer to that is that I think that's going to settle down. Like, especially once all the codexes are released, because then we'll, we'll have the idea of everything that's out. We know everything that's, we know what's broken. And, and I'm using broken in like, in the gamer slang version. We know what's powerful. And we know it's sure. supposed to be powerful. Like I'm a, I believe there should be strong units. There should be really bonkers things that that everyone can do because those things are often fun. Uh, how game impacting they are. I mean, that's you know, if it's too much, of course it's too much. But sometimes it just feels like it's too much, and it's really not. Yeah. Well, and when you think about after the codexes that have already been announced, the only two heavy hitters that readily come to mind that are left to to come out are Space Wolves and Orcs. Yeah. Uh, I, there's probably a couple others out there. I mean, we know that the sisters are coming because of the, the cool Adepticon announcement. But that's, that's going to be a fun thing to, to show people. I think that's really good. They're really going to illustrate the process. What, yeah. The whole process of like, okay, when someone asks for something, what does it really take to get it on the table? And it's not just somebody sculpting a miniature overnight and then putting to sure. a press and, you know, whatever. It's, it's a multi-year process. Yeah, for sure. No, I'm I'm all about that, and I'm I'm excited to see how that pans out. Uh, and, and especially, mm, there's there's so much I have to say about a sisters release coming because the the literature out there for them is really good. Yeah, it's it's Agreed. really good, and uh, it's it's, two, it's an exciting ago, thing to talk about. Yeah, two years ago, our Adepticon theme uh, was based off of a story that appeared first in the Sisters Battle Codex back in second or third edition. You're talking about the one from last year? The one uh, with the Centurions? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because two years ago, we were playing Eldar together, Paul. I know that you, you try not to remember that. Uh, no. But, <laughs> well, two Adepticons. I was like, that wasn't inspired by sisters. <laughs> two, two Adepticons ago at this point. <laughs> um, no, that wasn't inspired by sisters. But no, it was, uh, it, it, but speaking to their, their literature of how, of how interesting it is. So, it, and, you know, people, people dig it. And, you know, I hope, and I know people are going to get what they want. I mean, think about it. If, um, if, if your models are the last to come out, they're probably going to be gorgeous with it. I mean, think of the advances. Yeah, um, for sure. They, uh, they keep setting a, a real high bar with that. Yeah, it's it's gonna it's gonna be good times. So I guess leading us back to the original point, two big tournaments coming up. Uh, how do you prepare for them? Like, what is what does the FAQ do to you? And it, it may it's making a big difference in our ATC planning because with the ATC you had to be cognizant of factions. So uh, everyone you can only use a faction once. Right, um, and it's uh, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's mono faction for the one player. Or can you have like a allied? Oh, you can have an attack. You can have an allied. So you you can have you know Eldar and, and Drakari in the same list, but no one else could take Eldar or Drakari. Okay, so it is pretty much like exclusive like that. It's like yeah. one person gets to claim them, nobody else does. Yeah, that's right. Um, before I, we get too far here, probably too late, but uh, uh, Chris and I are going to do a, a short-ish segment, uh, and then I've got a spot with uh, Michael Chanel from Cool Mini or Not, where we talk about the Song of uh, Ice and Fire game that's coming out from them, that Kickstarter. It is based off of uh, the books uh, Song of Ice and Fire by George R. R. Martin. Okay. So it only uses the books uh, as a reference material for the game. I think the storyline and the campaigns and and what have you are going to uh, be drawn right from the books. And they're going to have an organized play uh, kit that comes out at the same time that the model's going to wide release. And so that's cool that they've got that as a focus. But he'll we'll, he'll talk about that. Uh, we can talk about our... our uh, our passion here, 40k and uh, Sigmar. Actually, I I planned out my um, Edeneth Deepkin army. Oh man, yeah, Codex I picked, Fishmen uh, I in picked, the flesh. Yeah, I mean they they've got a really cool story behind them. They actually have to go out and harvest souls 
uh, it's it's kind of neat what they've done, with, and they're in the Order faction, so it's kind of it's kind of neat how the like the daughters of Cain and these these soul harvesting um, soulless elves, as it were, uh, are are the kind of the darker side of Order, but yet they have a lot of the bright colors. Uh, yeah, like, Order just got a lot more edgy with yeah. these last two factions. And you know how I play? I went with all the the aggressive bells and whistles stuff. Like uh, in my list, I've I've put a lot of uh, the eel riders, the the water snake riders, and the shark riders in there there's an ability one of the characters has an ability to teleport himself and two other units to the other side of the board uh and then buff a unit's ability to charge or yeah it's it's pretty aggressive well it's definitely a distinct faction in all of sigmar just just like the looking at it from an enemy perspective where i've got you know I'm the only sigmar book that i really own or care about is the carriage and overlords and i can only shoot at the one that's closest to me and that Sounds obnoxious. <laughs> well, this is um, this is a unique and like the Caradon Overlords. This is com- is completely unique to Sigmar. Um, They've definitely done a lot to try and distance them- distance themselves from their old high fantasy style. That's more dare I say Tolkienish or Tolkien based. Since they already have a Tolkien well, game that's supported, right? So this feels so much more like they're owning these well, concepts. More importantly, there are 10 other companies that also have a similar token-based fantasy game. I think 10 might might be a bit conservative. Yeah, so but but this is I mean they they really are pushing it to be a unique uh flavorful game world and I mean whatever, I'm I'm buying in. I mean that's you know I've I've got the Sylvaneth uh, which, uh, which to me also have a unique flavor to them, and uh, now I'll be going in with this Deepkin. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I want to charge people with snake riders. I wasn't able to get one of those <laughs> giant turtles in my list. I'm kind of disappointed about that. Oh yeah, I think with the they they, they get tied on points. They're one of those. I think it's ultimately going to be a smallish figure count army. Uh, Interesting. So once you once you start putting everything in, and I went with the Eidolon, uh That's their that's their god avatar. Yeah, yeah, no, think, that's my favorite model from their range. Oh, it's be- it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, and this is just in the in the in the army list phase or whatever. But uh, I think you're going to have to choose whether or not you want one of the turtles or you want the Eidolon in a list. By the time you you take some other things. But the, one of the neat things is that those uh, sea snake riders, the eel rider guys, are become troops. They is they what is called battle line in Sigmar, but they become battle line if you take um, like the king that rides a seahorse. Yeah, those those sort of things remind me so much of the like kind of the glory days of fifth edition, where you had independent characters on forty k who could play with the one four sword ch- chart we got to play with at the time. Yeah, that yeah. that kind of stuff is fun to me. It, it's nostalgic. So I'll definitely be throwing up some stuff on on Twitter uh, at Warmaster underscore TPM as as I start to get the stuff assembled and paint it because they're they're beautiful models. I'm I'm gonna try to make them bright colored. Bright color, yeah. You can go for it. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try. You know, it's uh, it's you one. You do of a lot of earthy tones, so yeah. I mean, it, but it's it's so difficult to to like not have. Well, for me anyway, to not have the bright colors just seem like they're that they're painted on. You know, to try to make it look like it's an organic, brightly colored thing, I think is going to be a struggle for me. But you know, whatever. There's a bunch of t- tutorials out there. I, I think it must be said, Paul, that in any eventuality, any colors on those are going to be painted on. <laughs> that is true, but it just can't look, you know, it shouldn't look like it's, it's painted on, unless that's what you're going for. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Artistic license. <laughs> uh, I worked on my, um, my buddy's Necron list this week again. I've been painting those Necrons. They, they go really quick. Like this is, uh, this is more of a, uh, of a figure supply issue that he's got. Like I have, I have mm. painted everything he has brought over, except the model left, because I told him he's never going to play with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, it's so so sad, isn't it? I mean, well, the monolith. Not, now when you think the Tesseract, the Tesseract Vault and Tesseract Arc got way better. So, oh, by by no stretch of the imagination am I saying that those suck. It's just the monolith was the iconic Necron vehicle for so long, and it it feels like forever since I've actually seen one. Yeah, yeah, I could be wrong. Maybe there are some uses that I just haven't fully explored yet. But once you start throwing in. 10 destroyers and 10 wraiths, uh, you get real point thirsty. Ugh, 10 wraiths. I hate <laughs> it. I hate it already. I think once the deceiver model gets put in the list, and that is in like the, the list we've got, he'll lose a couple of dis- destroyers and a couple of wraiths. 
Yeah, for sure. I I really like the the dece- the the deceiver tactics. Yeah. It's and the model itself, while it's a bit dated in comparison to the other sort of epic things that are in 40k right now with the newer sculpts and designs and things, uh, it's got a lot of potential for customization. So those things are out of stock everywhere. And so yeah. if, if there's anybody out there that has a deceiver they want to trade or it needs to be cleaned up or dusted up and they're not, they're not going to put in their list, let me know. I can get it to this dude and <laughs> put in his list because he, he doesn't even have one right now or it would be painted. Yeah, I I saw one go up on the barter bucket like live, right, that it was 20 bucks for the deceiver and 20 bucks for the Nightbringer. And I was like, man, I wish I had 20 bucks right now. <laughs> Well, if anybody out there has a spare one, please hit us up on Facebook or on Twitter or whatever. I'm sure we can try to work something out. Uh, but that's, it's, uh, he found one. He's like, I found one, but it doesn't have an arm. Can you make it work? I'm like, no. If that model has no scale equivalent. There's no arm that's going to look good on that dude. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I don't, I'm not and I'm not going to have you shopping it or showing it around to people and saying that <laughs> Paul did this. <laughs> oh, so it's, it's your reputation on the on the line, huh? <laughs> I mean, I guess I can figure out something. Put a use the tentacle maker to like you know put out a hose or something. But nope, did not want that. <laughs> it's just you know give him a demon prince arm. It's like this is my strong hand. Yeah. But I did. I, I you know painted the warriors went up super quick. Did the scarabs also super quick? Left them on the sprue. Painted them on the sprue. I might have said that already on the show, and I apologize if, if I have. But uh, yeah, yeah, you're uh, talking about that. Uh, painting the scarabs on the sprue went. I mean, I'm talking about like 30 minutes. Add 15 bases of scarabs done. Hmm. Now, no. see, me, I'm I'm painting a ton of Infinity models right now, and those do not paint fast. No, I, I can imagine not, especially with all the lenses and stuff like that on them. Lenses and buttons, and, like, they've got so many buckles, so many buckles and pouches. I, I don't know what they just, put in all of these see, pouches. Turn into Necrons. Necrons have no buckles and pouches. Mm, it's becoming more <laughs> appealing every day. Just, it's, like, I, bring this guy, oh, yeah, here, here are your Infinity models. These look like... Necrons. I know we talked about it. And look, and I'd be painting this army for him, even if they weren't what, what I consider <laughs> fairly easy to paint. Uh, they lend themselves to, so, you know, the cheater techniques that we've talked about over the years of, of finishing moves of, you know, dark color, draw brush a light color. In this case, the darker metal, draw brush a lighter color metal. Uh, mm-hmm. A single edge highlight on a small armor piece. Yeah, you know, and if you want, you can get a little little crazy with a with some uh, with a recess wash of whatever or the glaze eye or color. something. Yeah, right? glaze, right? Yeah, of like yeah, this lends itself to to really pop it up. And then the bases, you know, we talk about quick way to do interesting and dynamic bases, and it really just all comes together with the Necrons. <laughs> like if you uh, you want to paint a two thousand point army in a week, this is your jam. This is what you need to, to go to. There's actually uh, it, the stores or some hobby stores used to hold painting competitions of uh, you buy like a battle force and uh, and and then you have three days to paint it or something. The money is always on the Necron. Like get the Necron, <laughs> buy the Necron battle force, paint it, and then use whatever the prize is to get whatever you really wanted. Well, and then you have plenty of extra time to paint other things after you finish that one two weeks before everybody else does. Yeah, yeah, I, but I, yeah, I think it's like a like a, I don't know if there, people are still doing it out there, but that was a that was a time honor technique of how to win the store painting contest. <laughs> Show up with a finished Necron force that doesn't that looks like the Necron force is supposed to look like. Yeah, and then the Harlequins player is just rolling his eyes at yeah, you the whole time. <laughs> well, he made a poor choice. <laughs> Oh, I can't wait uh, for the Harlequins to come out. I actually, I know we're jumping around in, in a little bit of topics, but I'm practicing for an, an ATC game, and with with Rule Three and all that kind of stuff in, in effect, and and still tr- and trying to take a little bit different take on the Inari list, especially after. Uh, like Shining Spears, what people used to do with Shining Spears, and I say used to do, what people did up until a couple of weeks ago with Shining Spears was drop in the Shining Spears with a stratagem, quicken them so they they move uh, in advance and then charge. And so they're able to get real deep into back lines, tie things up, hit things that, that would have never been hit uh, were they not able to do this. Right. I mean, that was... That was basically the the main gimmick behind the the list that won the LVO. Yeah, it's 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 incredibly strong because I mean, in a lot of these armies, like an Imperial Guard line, for instance, they have the string of things that you have to grind through, or you just jump over them, um, and then you get to touch their tanks, and then their tanks don't get to do anything for a round or two. 
at the minimum a round or two. Uh, and so, but with, with Quicken not doing that anymore, I find Shining Spears a lot less appealing. So I went with a, a little bit different of a makeup. Uh, this list I had, uh, and, and this is just, this is not the final uh, end of the list, but it was a Yunari list because Yunari is still cool. With several wave serpents, three units of dark reapers, one fat one and two two little ones. I think that's the standard uh, configuration the, that that we'll see now. Uh, I took two twenty man units of guardians with weapon platforms because sometimes just shooting a lot of shuriken pistols or shuriken, shuriken catapults will do tons of damage to things. I mean, it's great to you know just throw irony in people's faces. Oh, you're outnumbered by Eldar. <laughs> well, then you never know when a soul burst, like a, just a, a quirky soul burst, <laughs> might work on something. You know, to get it to to do something it wasn't going to do before. Wasn't this a dying race? <laughs> They're still dying, one one fact at a time. <laughs> Eventually, be ground to the bottom of the solar system. All I'm saying is, Biltan seems a lot less fractured than they made it out to oh, be. My, all, all my stuff is Biltan. That's everything was. <laughs> it's like like we never <laughs> left. We just added that. Uh, but I, uh, where I'm going, where I was going anyway, is but I added a solitaire to the list. I really like solitaires. Uh, he's, I mean, with he does his blitz attack. I mean, he's got he's, he moves a long way. He gets ten attacks. You got next to saves. He's doing tons of damage. Uh, he's got a three plus invulnerable save. No, I, I love sneaky little bullies like that. It's one of my favorite things about about Mephiston. It's just he's this one model that can come in and just ruin somebody's plan and get somewhere to hurt somebody. Yep. Yeah, I, I love having that kind of. I, I don't want to call him an assassin, right? Because there are assassins for that sort of thing. But but they are that sneaky little knife they're, thrust. They're a heat-seeking missile. That's what they yeah, are. It's, it's a, a wrench in the works. Yeah, they're an actual hunter killer missile that works. <laughs> the, the one that isn't Gullum independent. <laughs> oh, I got it. Was this game that I played is not um, not indicative of how things that most games are. I was actually playing against another stout list of Magnus. Uh, three Heldrakes, uh, Araman on a disc, uh, a couple of Demon Princes. Uh, he had some Nurglings, and he had a, like a big fat unit of Plague Bears. It was it was a neat list. Uh, I really did I did enjoy it. And then he just I just couldn't get him to fail Magnus saves. And, and I have a magic power that people may not know know about, but it's the power to bless my opponent to make all of the invulnerable saves. Oh, you didn't make seven four plus in a row. Yeah, go for yeah. it. Yeah, do it. Uh, I mean, it wasn't. I mean, and of course, I don't think it was too far out of the, out of scope. But it's in the fact that if man, if I just put one more wound to that guy, why didn't I put one more wound to that guy? And then I and then in the round two, I just kept cursing myself. Is like I could have fired my serpent shields. Like he'd already be dead right now if I just fired my serpent shields. Such a noob. He had one wound left on him. My solitaire, who I blitz and goes over and charges him, um, doesn't kill him. No, isn't that just he makes like the seven worst. four plus saves? It it's was just, uh, it was it was really the first even thing. when you like someone a lot, like they're you know, they're your good buddy and they're across the table. He is from my you. good buddy, and then he makes like a eleven inch plague bearer charge to to uh, wreck over my whole strategy on the other side of the table. I'm like, this is not how I envisioned this. This is not how I drew it up. You just sometimes you look at them like you hate them. You don't really hate them. <laughs> And, you know, you're, you're torn between feeling so, so proud of your friend. It's like, oh man, great role, man. That yeah. sucks. Uh, like, I mean, we were, we were helping each other along the way. Like, oh, you oh, know, yeah, sure. go here because you're going to want to consolidate here. You're going to want to do that. You want to do this. But it's still, when it came time to roll the dice, like he still got that long charge and Magnus still sloughed off a, a berserk, a blitzing, uh, solitaire and all the dark reaper shots that went on him before to get him down to that one wound. God, it was so, <laughs> So miserable on my side. I played Val uh, the the day before. No, two days. Oh yeah, before. how did that go? There was plenty uh, of smack talk. That was involved all there. smack talk. He won the game. Oh, Paul. Well, I didn't. Good know. job, Val. Good on you. I know. I, I know you're out there. I, he, I, I give you a good pat on the butt. He played flawlessly. There's no question about that. We were playing <laughs> the ETC rules, and they use a combination of progressive objectives. Uh, which again, you're welcome. And <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome, Europe. Uh, and, uh, the tactical objectives. And Interesting. Those, you know, it's, that's a, a very much a, a system of the rich get richer and the poorer get poorer. Um, 
I've never, I'm full full stop. I've never enjoyed the randomness of tactical objectives. I mean, it's all it's great when like you're e- you're drawing equal numbers of of both useful and non useful things. But when you are player, let's just call it let's call him player P. <laughs> let's say you're let's say you're player P, and you draw eleven cards, and you can score two of them. <laughs> <laughs> and your yeah. opponent George, scores 11, 11 cards, and he can score uh, nine of them. You mm. are uh, you're you're rowing upstream. That's <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, that's that's one of the for for beer and pretzels, whatever, right? But uh, for for a competitive setting, not a fan. But oh. hey, whatever people have fun playing, they're gonna oh. play. And do beer, you. beer it was, or at least something like that. Val being being a guest, he did not have to do anything of the sort, but he did bring over a bottle of uh, whiskey. And let's just say on that, after I drew those eleven cards and couldn't score anything, I was like, you know what? It's time for the whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> So my day went just fine. So I'm I'm happy for you. Uh, <laughs> uh, my dread knight did kill two shield captains and Celestine and a unit of uh, the bikes. He was oh, was how how did he feel about the uh, the, the gray knights? The gray knights, the troops only had a unit of a strike squad and then the dread knight, and he did not he did not respect them. At the beginning of the game, he did not. <laughs> and a lot of the sessions, he had one, some officer. It was some, some, uh, four wound officer, three wound, four wound officer sitting back in an objective, like, I'm just going to deep strike over here and, uh, fire my dudes and you're going to kill that's going to kill that guy. All right. And I'll charge him. I'll charge him. I'll smite him once. Then I'll shoot and then I'll charge. The guy's going to be dead. I want to be over there near that objective. It's going to be great. Well, smited, uh, charged a shot, failed the charge. Uh, and then forgot that I had a psi cannon on the on the unit. <laughs> and that's that was after Boo's class one. <laughs> oh man! So he's just over there. He's on the objective, and I and I charge him and fail fail the charge. You know, so he he scores that point. And like, oh well, that's my my bad. <laughs> and it, it was yeah. that's one of those things. I'm just kicking myself. Like if I just shot the psi cannon, uh, then he he has one wound left at this point. He's not he's not going to have that wound anymore. Hopefully, with the psi cannon. With this guy's oh, man. five plus armor save, or what have you. <laughs> but then it becomes, you know, it's that it's that game of physics. Like he, like his his goal there is to not be some military commander of telling people what to do. His goal is to just be a piece on the board that's racking up points. Uh, that's the uh, uh, that that's his job. Then he can do it because it Call doesn't take long. Caiaphas Kane strategy. Yeah, and it doesn't take long for for him to. Close out my five dudes over there because he, he then gets to come in with his um, scions and bust up that strike squad. I, I got to admit, I love scions. I think yeah. that they're they're really cool. Beautiful models. Yeah, they're, they're awesome. Cool tricks. Yeah, definitely cool tricks. Very awesome. So the Dread Knight I bring in on the other side because he's got those two shield captains. Celestine's over there. And I'm thinking, you know, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's it. I charge a shield captain. Celestine intervenes, and I beat the shield captain down to one wound. I split attacks, actually. Uh, put a couple of attacks on the shield captain, and then put a couple of attacks on the other bike squad that had come in, because he used the stratagem. Oh, that stratagem. Yeah. That I'm going to oh, I'm gonna charge your charge. Yeah, so killed a couple of those uh, after he got it, because he gets, he gets to charge first. He didn't do any wounds. No, he did, sure. he did, he did a couple of wounds uh, to, the, to the Dread Knight, but not enough. And then I swing, split the attacks, get the shield captain down to one wound, like thinking, crap, one wound shield captain. Should have just put more attacks on him to finish him off. Uh, and then the other side of it, I do take out um, one or two of the bikes that came through. Because the sword does D6 damage. Right. So you can get pretty lucky. Uh, Celestine, who had taken some damage, I, I, either to some psychic powers or to the, um, the Gatling silencer that was on his arm, wasn't at full strength either. So they uh, then turn on him, beat him down, and he's down to one or two wounds. Uh, and then they they finally finish him off in the next round, and then I do the in death, does do the end, right? And then kill the rest of them. Had a boy. Yeah, not, I mean, I'm talking like kill Celestine, kill the rest of them, bike clowns, <laughs> kill, kill kill the shield captain. Like everybody died over there. So that guy did what he was supposed to do. Yeah, he's a champion. Yeah. So we ended the game, and I was uh, we ended the game. With he had 
three or four models left on the table. Uh, and I had the majority of all my tanks. I'm playing Imperial Guard with that one unit of Grey Knights. Uh, the majority of my stuff still on the table. Not the troops. Uh, uh, there was a lot of naked troops, but the Sentinels and all the tanks and stuff were still alive. Now, he was doing a great job of locking them down. I don't want to make it seem like this was like a foregone conclusion, like when we left. But he had also scored nine points from those cards. Well, I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't expect uh, Val to not not bring his A game. Oh, he played you great. Know? I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm sure he... Yeah, I'm, and, you know, dice being what they are, they are what they are. Cards being what they are, they are what they are. But, you know, Dude, when, when you're... I 11 cards. I just yeah. want to score half of them. Well, actually, I want to score... I want to score all of them, but I'd like to at least be able to score half of them. Right. But uh, that doesn't mean at, at any point that, you know, you, you check out of the game completely. Yeah. You know, may, maybe three glasses of whiskey and you do. But... <laughs> I was three. Is three the limit? I, just, I held in there past that. You, you, you know I'm not so super knowledgeable about this. So <laughs> Then we went and sat on my porch and smoked cigars. So really, everyone won. <laughs> I mean, that sounds like, you know... A, a good day of gaming. Why not? It was. It really was. Oh man. No, it was. I know. There's no begrudging his victory. He did. He did win on. Uh, not even just on paper. He won. Like there was. That is the way that game was going to be played. Uh, with with those things, and we both accepted it going in. We had two decks. Uh, we we drew what we drew, and that is just how Warhammer goes sometimes. Uh, I don't prefer that style of play. Um, with cards, with that much random element, because I feel when I'm when I'm running a game or when I'm running my army, I like to believe that my army has a mission, whether that's dictated by that mission, uh, and it's something they can follow through from start to finish, a plan from start to finish. Either way, that be to to out to outwit my opponent, to out, to out uh, maneuver them, or to grind them in the dust. Like that's I want to feel like I that that's part of the game plan. Yeah. And even if I lose, I want to bloody their nose. Yeah. Well, yeah, have something to, yeah. Even if I lose, I know that I did it while I was trying to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. Yeah. Uh, you want as, to walk away from set. a game feeling like that. Yeah. You know? as, as set by the mission. And, but these are all like, oh, let me just roll a die and see where I'm supposed to go. It's like if you were to, you know, get an army, an army van, you're a guy in one of those army trucks with all your dudes in the back and your, your orders are to go across the street and do this. Well, halfway to your getting there, you get a message from, from command that says, nope, nope, just kidding, go somewhere else. Like, ah. <laughs> and, and then, and I then, wish Ricky and Troop were here for yeah, this explanation. You just, yeah, they say that's just normal. You should be used to it. <laughs> but, uh, but then you're like three minutes from your next uh, objective, and they're like, "Nope, sorry, got to turn around, go back the other way." And, and I feel like that's all. That's what the Maelstrom of War type stuff does, and I cannot stand. I'll play it. I'll play it, especially if I like the people that are running the tournament, and that's just what they've chosen to do. I'll play it. You know, it's it's it takes a lot to run one of these tournaments. Everybody has this different idea of what's broken. You know, whatever whatever is you know the unpopular guy's list in your local store. Oh man, that's so broken. Like there, there are so many different examples of going to traveling around to different metas and with the same list and being confronted with, oh, you brought that and looked down upon and then somewhere else. So it's like, oh my gosh, that is so broken. Why would you bring something like that? Like this, everybody seems to have, have their own idea of, on what is broken. But, but when you're coming to a tournament, guys, please. Like, don't hate on somebody for bringing something good as long as it follows the rules. <laughs> yeah. You know, if it's following the rules, it's it's not – even if it's really good, that just means that they're you know, good on them for taking it. Now they just got to play well with it, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think that said, it's, uh, is doctoring up the environment to – when you are making changes to the environment, the eco- ecosystem, as it were, uh, you need an agenda. Like you, as a, as whoever is doing it, needs an agenda. Like what are what issue are you trying to solve? What are you trying to make sure happens or doesn't happen? Um, I think that's that's the takeaway. And and uh, yeah, sure. And if you can avoid doing things like Maelstrom of War, I would be happier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, at, at least we know what we're getting into. As long as the list the the lists of missions uh, I, are I published can in advance, promise you. The Louisville Slugger, there will be no mails from a war. All uh, right. Well, we have you on record, Paul. I can me. promise you that. If there is, that if, if it if something shows up that looks like it, I'm probably a pod person, and you have the right to detain me. 
Yeah, well, I mean, it's you're breaking your campaign promises. You'll lose voters. <laughs> Not if I admit to being a pod person. <laughs> uh, and I shouldn't say it wasn't fun. Like if we if we had drawn, like if he and I had drawn the the similar objectives, like a similar types of things, then it would have uh, been a much better game. But at the same time, he could have just out outplayed me. I mean, like what it really came down to was well, what really came down was scoring nine points from random cards in that one turn, and then me scoring none the next turn. Like, well, this is an uphill, uphill battle. <laughs> Neat. Uh, a- after drawing 11 cards. That was, the, that was the worst. So what's the perfect system? I don't know. Well, I feel like closer than that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, hold on, hold on. Let's see. We need to just combine this one with your paint rubric rant. <laughs> and then we just got, you know, they call it Look, the grousing episode. I, I know some of the ETC guys listen. Like whenever they want to get it, their their stuff, you know, functional, where other people might be able to uh, duplicate. <laughs> I should say duplicate it, but respect it. Um, and I mean this in the nicest of way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, you know, in in the South where Paul's from, this is called the bless your heart speech. <laughs> yeah, bless your heart with your little, your little uh, uh, objective cards that you draw randomly every time that you don't let people stack the deck. I mean, like, get 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 it, even it, go far as the Shade Spire thing. Build your own deck. Build your own deck of cards, right? But here's some rules about how to build your deck of cards. Hmm. Yeah, I can only imagine the shenanigans that a TO would have to go through to police people to make sure that they're building their decks of cards. Well, you make, that's the penalty. Okay, cool. You show up with two of these cards you're only supposed to have one of, you are getting axed. Your whole team, none of your points count, and it will flip your next two wins to draws or losses or whatever. I mean, then this, that's the kind of level you can get real biblical on people as far as punishments go, uh, depending on, you know, how you want your tournament to go. But I'm just saying. Hmm. Flipping random cards. Yeah. 40K with deck building. Yeah. You heard it here first. Well, I'm I'm cool, but if that's the way... Okay, they seem to want to pride themselves on being a different brand of 40k than what 40k actually is and i'm i'm absolutely cool with that uh there are there are things that we do and we'll make differences to all over the place yeah uh, i think i think everybody's guilty of that right yeah t- tournaments will say well we're we are real 40k and you can't bring this why you can't bring that you can't do this and and we're all just supposed to accept that they are real 40k and and be fine with it and, and i don't care the game is modular the game is um ultimately modular and, and can, can can conform to whatever it is that you need if, if you want to play the models and people want to show up yeah but if uh if you're going to go that route with these cards it just seems like you are just creating what is the potential for so many tables to have just this sopping seeping fun sponge at every turn <laughs> am i am i wrong i mean well, I mean, you're kind of preaching to the choir here. I, I already said I, I don't much care for Maelstrom stuff. So, I mean, if you're looking for someone to, to disagree, you're probably looking I just in want the to wrong know place. If, if, I, if it sounds like I'm too charged, if I'm, if I'm too um, excited about the outcome being one way or another. I don't know. All's, all's I think now is that Val is going to be able to claim that he gave you, like, Maelstrom PTSD. <laughs> oh, he, play, he played well. Uh, he really did. Uh, and it was it was a fun game, and then it was good use of his... He had a great awareness of the, the board state, uh, and with the deployment zone that we had, some of my options were limited, and the one... And, and I shouldn't say that. I was going to say, the, and the one mistake I made... No, uh, one of the mistakes that I made... Uh, he was able to capitalize on, which kept uh, some of my heavy tanks from firing in round two. And so that was good. The I did have two primary psychers near one of my tanks just for that inevitable situation for him running a character over and touching it uh, so I could burn them down in the psychic phase and not have fallen back from that character so then I could then shoot in the shooting phase. Right. That was satisfying when that happened. Mm, I imagine that feels pretty good. Yeah, that that trick only worked once in that game. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm sure that felt pretty good the one time then. (laughs) I had it all lined up too. The next one, my tank commander was gonna was gonna Overwatch on fives. No, anyway, none of that stuff came to be. Uh, but what really did it was just get, getting so far out of reach on the objective cards. I would have liked to seen a seen a way. Like if we're out of you building my deck, I would have I would have put things. Well, I don't know what I would have put in there, but I would definitely not have put eleven things in there that I couldn't have done. 
Uh, but but on the other side of that, if I was actually more familiar with the deck, I probably wouldn't have put some things in my list either that I knew wouldn't be able to accomplish a lot of the goals. Mm. So it's you know it goes both ways. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I I believe this is pretty similar to a list that you've been playing with for a long time that involves you know guard and gray knight allies and you know the sentinels pushing up to kind of create yeah. uh, some more of those barriers and things like that. And and that I I feel like is a pretty versatile list in in its several different gaming environments, right? It's because you've got that move out, you know, push up in the early game, you know, creating that buffer. As, uh, Sentinels are great for that kind of thing. You've got, of course, the reliable cheap infantry. And you've got the dependability of the Manticore damage. I, I, I you know, you've got some good tools in that list. Well, I like it. The list the list is strong. It has won uh, several tournaments, but they were more traditional tournaments with not game not uh random objectives that change every game every turn <laughs> anyone else tasting something bitter i'm i'm tasting cranberries right now this is <laughs> <laughs> look just i di- okay i'm yeah, as we know i just don't like it when the objectives change every single round yeah well it it's frustrating it it is frustrating when you're in a game and you have to you have to have something that does everything but the tools that you have maybe even in your army don't exist to accomplish all of those very goals. But one of the one of the big frustrations I had in talking to a guy in seventh edition, he, he I remember this conversation well. He he looks at me and he says, Seventh edition Maelstrom is the only way to play real 40k and anyone who disagrees with me doesn't have any expletive. So that started an interesting conversation. Oh, as, really? as you can bet. Uh, and the, the his strategy was basically this: when he built his list, he built it so that about forty percent of your opponent's deck could no longer be used. Yeah, okay. And that's that was his list building strategy, and that's why he liked to play to play that was because he had an army which could deny forty percent of of the deck. Yeah, I mean, not that's, everybody has an army like that. I don't know why you wouldn't do it. Exactly. But and you, how is that fun, right? When when you're playing at least on on the the non maelstrom side, right? When when you're getting these cards, especially because he was one of those people who who enforced the you can only discard like once, you know, one card or whatever per turn if you wanted to. It, it, he would play that very strictly because he counted on people not being able to score against him ever because oh. Destroy a vehicle? Well, I don't have any vehicles. Destroy a monster? Well, I don't have any monsters. No, all, all I've <laughs> Destroy got a flyer? Is, no flyers. Yeah, exactly. I, I've got all of these things. Now, the only thing that you could do, right, was like kill an independent character because there was no way of getting around that. But, you know, it was it was a lot of just stuff like that. And his games just ground down to, I've got a bunch of pretty much unkillable Necron infantry. Yeah. That... To, to take away us all the way back to the original of this about how do you make how do you make missions for tournaments? <laughs> Not that way. <laughs> right. I, 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 I definitely I, would I, agree. I joked, I joked some degree. I mean, it is a large tournament, and people people put a lot of effort into it. Like to them, um, this is you know like the their their Olympics, and it's a big it's a big deal. I mean, people want to win, and in any system, you can find a way to do to to play in any system. I'm just I did not game towards the system. I just was just taking a powerful list into the environment, and I happened to be on the bad end of a of an eleven card draw where I couldn't score any points, and that was um an eye opener of like how often does this happen were i to fly my little butt over to croatia and have this happen how would i feel <laughs> is that is that the etc headquarters of croatia but that's that's it it's like if, if if i were to if i were to be over there that's enough about enough about that they have a di- just a different style of play but it, but uh how neat is it that all these areas can have the different style of play and they're all thriving well it, it is great to see 40k on the whole thriving and it's great also to see just I think the hobby as a whole is is doing really well. And people talk about 30K like 30Ks did, but, I mean, you wouldn't know it from the 30K communities I'm a part of. Mm. You know, just, uh, it's it's only my local area that I would say that it's at least less common than it was, but it's not dead. Well, because, like, 40K has so many people playing this game that they can make little tweaks here and there. And, and even if it, it – let's just say it alienated 10% of the players, there could be – I, you know, still a hundred million people on the other side of it that are going to be just fine. Yeah, I, I don't think that that it has to be like a a mutually exclusive who wins, right? I think it's just a matter of you know what are you playing today? 
Yeah, and you can think of of every every change as a zero sum game. You, you could you could do that, and in some in some situations that will apply. Oh but yeah, it, for sure. Yeah, but but some of the stuff it does just lead itself to things to things winning. It's winning more often than they did, and so that's that's the kind of stuff that you'll see, and that's what we're like. I I don't know that I can talk completely intelligently about what the new meta is going to look like right now. Uh, without having too many large or even medium-sized tournaments under the belt. I think that our ATC list is shaping up to what I think kind of either meta craft or to already fit into something that's in the meta. We'll see how it goes. I think that with some of these changes, you can actually build lists because you have to have defenders and attackers in this uh, environment. Yeah, and you're you're talking about the slugger, right? No, just for the ATC. Oh, ATC. Okay. Yeah, the ATC is uh, where you where the idea was that that you had uh, defenders and attackers, and then someone was the champion, and, and the two champ champions couldn't be chosen as a defender or attacker. But at the end of the game or end of the matching, that the champion would the champions would would play each other. Sure. Well, at some point, uh, that became too exploitive, and so we've now gone to this. You put out everyone. Everyone puts out two lists. Uh, to fight one list, and then the other person, the person with the one list, picks one of those two lists he wants to fight. Mm. The, okay. The Slugga, the Louisville Slugga, is just is a traditional uh, five or one 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 on one five round. Tournament. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which we do have. We've got uh, shirts up for sale right now and dice for sale. You can find those at the uh, ForgesNarrative dot net on the merch page. Uh, I have a shirt. I'll post a picture of myself uh, up in a shirt pretty soon. And uh, it looks good. The artist turned out really good. Go Boy did the art. Fourth shift. It does print. have his particular style. Yeah, and it works out great for this stuff. Uh, fourth shift printing did the shirt printing. And they're the same ones that have done my Wrong Way Kid printing. They're the same ones that have done some other shirt printings for me. Just doing gr- great work. Easy to deal with. Cool guys. We got some nice shirts. And it's a cool, it is a cool design. Right on. Pick up the dice, even if you're just curious. Or get a t-shirt at events that sell t-shirts, and especially the ones that pre-sell t-shirts. And, and even if you can't come to the event, but you you still want to support the event, buying some of this swag is a, like the easiest way to do it. You just put in the order, and then we mail it to you. There you go. And it shows up at your house a few weeks later. As soon as, it, as soon as it gets into our door, it's out to your door in a week or so. We get those kind of questions all the time. I'm not coming. Can I still buy a shirt? Yes. We want you to be there, but you can definitely still get a shirt. Yep. You can wear the shirt during the time, the same time as the event, and, you know, let let your emotions travel through the warp in support the event. <laughs> Take some pictures. Be like, hold this, hold this event in three places. <laughs> Yeah, that you know, mess mess a little bit with Google's online tracking. <laughs> so I, I'm I love it. That scene up there in, in Louisville, it, it's a combination. It's got a combination of like uh, real you know pro tournament players, and then you got s- some folks that are just want to be in the casual, the, the the narrative style players. And so how do you how do you bring them both together in a way that's going to be cool? I think the missions are are shaping up to where that's possible. I also like some of the stuff that, that we've started incorporating locally with some of our two day events and things is where we're creating, you know, the brackets, the day two brackets where, you know, the brackets have winners. So the people who are matched up together who play that way, you know, pl- you know, the people who play in a similar fashion are going to end up together, you know, yeah. on, on the second day that everybody can feel like, you know what, for this bracket among the people that I like to play, this is how well I did and this is how I was rewarded for it. Those yeah. are really good ways to just reward people for enjoying the game as much as they can. Yeah, absolutely. I told you, you know, this is going to be the first opportunity to win the FTM trophies, the unique trophies uh, from Shapeways for FTM is going to be at the Slugga. Uh, and then there's going to be a couple, for a couple of the awards, uh, the criteria of how you win them is, is going to be different. Like for at least two of them, just having a fully painted army is one of the criteria for winning the, the, the thing. Mm, I love that. I, I love emphasis on the hobby. And it's it's especially cool because, you know, you helped Reese with the ITC hobby track and that's now live. Yes. Yeah, very nice. It's a really, really cool to see it all come together. And I want to be best Blood Angel next year. Yeah, man. That's pretty much my goal all the time. We'll, we'll see how it goes. First, yeah. I got to get out of the house and play some more. Yeah, well, it, it will be difficult. And that's what it is. This thing will be difficult. And I know there's, that we could talk a whole, whole section on that hobby track, but it's something that I think that once this gets completely up and going and accepted, that we will see certain tournaments 
that only want to run the hobby track as their ITC scores for that weekend. And you know what? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I still think the net of it all is that you're still running more tournaments and who cares? Yeah. And and it's going to bring out that that audience of people who may, maybe they're a little bit more worried about that guy, even though that guy, you know, statistically speaking, is not as common. Or he exists or he exists everywhere. Like or yeah. he exists on the painting side. He he brings some crappy painted stuff that he believes is golden demon quality. Right. You know, or, or you have, you know, m- maybe there will be a new type of 40 gig controversy where the hobby track winner is the one who paid the best commissioned painter and didn't tell anyone. See, I don't even care if you didn't scandal. tell anyone or not. Like, get the point. Get the points. No, show but somebody's show gonna care, Paul. Somebody's no, gonna I get, care. I get it. But you know how he's gonna win? He's gonna win by going, taking that army to five or ten different tournaments. That's how he's gonna win. You know what's gonna, you know, you know who's gonna benefit from that? Those five or ten tournaments that he went to, and everyone that got to see that army that gets to go home. For at, let's say at the first tournament he went to, and there was there was fifty people there. Those fifty people got to see that champion army and go tell who knows how many number of, of their friends that when they go to these things they come back and they see this chance you see champion level armies at these tournaments and then, so the next time somebody brings another champion army so now you got two champion armies there and they go back and go man between this year and last year our champion armies doubled we are on fire let's start making champion armies of our own and then boom hobby scene i love it if that if it improves the hobby of the game like if, I, I want i would love for people to walk into a 40k hall anywhere or everywhere rather where they look at it and go you know what there's some real hobby on show <laughs> yeah. you know? and and not just the one or two guys who are always amazing we we we, we all know who those guys are because there's Enough, not enough of them, really. That you, you, they've you, got some natural talent that, right. that bleeds through past just their amount of hours that they want to put. Yeah. Yeah, one of the one of the things you know about Adepticon that uh, I, I I heard in the the 30k room because 30k's always had a little bit I would say a little bit more of a determined hobby group in in the Adepticon events is that they they go to the 40k room and they're like oh huh, it's okay. What one of the things they said was how impressed they were with Sigmar's hobby showing and how Sigmar blew 40k out of the water in terms of great paint jobs and cool cool tables and cool just a great showing you know and and people who wouldn't normally look at Age of Sigmar turned to that and said hey you know what I could I would really enjoy that and and the secret to that you know the secret sauce to that was better hobby yeah and, and if it gets more people to show up I call it a win yeah. I mean, that's it. That's that's really how this all works. You know, you can have it on that side, or you can have it be hate fueled. You don't want you don't want that guy across across the uh, hall there to get more points than you. So you've got to paint better, and then somebody else hates <laughs> on you. They don't want you to get more points. And so they have to keep they have to keep paint better than you. Like, yes, whatever. yes. But, let, the end, but the end result's the same. Let the dark side of the hobby flow through you. <laughs> but I, what I'm, where I'm going is that the end result is the same. Is that if the if the when all of this has happened after the after the uh, the hate circle has come fully around the cir- uh, the cycle of hate. Yes, you still are left with ten people with ten beautifully painted armies that will attract who knows else. However else, <laughs> they have beautifully painted armies and scowly, angry faces. Yeah. So who? Cares? I'm not sure this is yeah. the greatest sell it like selling pitch you've given. Who, Paul. who cares if they bought the army? Who cares if whatever? <laughs> like you, what you're doing is releasing it out there and into the wild. Like hey, pro armies, beautiful armies come through here every now and then. Let's step up our game. If we want to win these points. No. Well, I mean, really, the showing of an army does so much to create the dignity of an event. The caliber, let's let's say caliber is the word I'm looking for. Yeah. Is that there are certain times where you go to an event and you think, part of my ticket price is wasted by the poor hobby showing that's going to be there. Right? You think, oh, I showed up to play five games and I got creamed by three people with bare plastic armies. Like, why am I spending money on this? But I tell you what, that experience, even if you get creamed three times, but playing against a fully painted, beautiful army, it's a softer blow. It is. It really is. There's nothing worse than like this guy painted his figures with a roller in his fingers. And <laughs> here he is just rolling sixes. Ah, it's miserable. Yeah. All, but yeah. It, that is softened by, uh, I don't care where you got it. eBay doesn't matter to me. Yeah. So no, I'm, I'm fully in, you know, speaking as a, you know, I, w- I would say a 
I am a commission painter, but I'm definitely not a, an, an army painter, right? I, I paint models and squads and things for people. But the effect that it has on the players that I've seen who wouldn't have that normally, who now have something that they can play with and be proud of. I painted a, an Imperial Knight for somebody who got to use it right away, and it was you know an instant favorite model of his. And he really... Like his excitement over, it. and he was colorblind. Oh, right. So, or at least partially colorblind. And the the joy that he had of having some cool stuff on the table, like it made a difference to him. And that isn't to say that his own efforts were were terrible. The fact that he shows up, you know, despite having that, uh, the fact that he shows up, and he at least always has the three color minimum. Like, there's nothing to hate on about that, right? Mm -hmm. But. The palpable joy that he had in having someone say, "Oh wow, that looks cool." That was that was really cool to watch. And I'm and I'm, I'm he he's he's a listener. He knows he knows who he is. That's cool. But uh, it it was really cool to see him feel more excited about that. He's actually going to have me do something else for him here Very in the nice. near future. So the the Slugger coming up as a total hobby experience. We'll be using uh, Hobby Track if it's in a usable form and BCP. You can actually register through BCP uh, for the Louisville Slugger. Uh, we've had some registers coming in through there. Uh, that is another way to do it right from the app. I believe, if I, if I remember correct, you can do it right from the app. Uh, and there's going so. to be a good mix of folks. It is going to be Party City. You know, that's... This is, this is going to be a, a really good time. I know there's going to be some activities that we do uh, outside of just the tournament, and we'll have more uh, announcements around those as we get closer to those dates. Uh, anyway, where I was going, that's going to be a total hobby thing where the hobby track and the, the point track, the ITC point track, will be used. But uh, on something like Battle Haven, I think Battle Haven, uh, that is uh, you know, the idea, I think, and we're not, we're not putting words in their mouth, or I'm not trying to put words in their mouth, but I could easily see the, be, that being an environment to where they run an event, a small, even if it's a small invitation event, uh, like the guys over there in, uh, uh, what is it, SN over in Gibraltar. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the Gibraltar SN Battle Reports guys. Yeah, so you know, where they run a, an event that has a bit of a guest list where it's only like they're the only thing that's getting reported are hobby scores. Yeah, and one of the cool things about SN Battle Reports and their no retreat Gibraltar event was when you buy your ticket, you have to send photos of your models because mm -hmm. they have this standard. They're like, well, we, we are a Battle Reports site photos are an important part of what we do and so the quality of the models that are on the table has to be respected and the photos that come out of that are really cool and there are people there like uh you know tabletop tactics went out there to to play so you know that there's people who go over there to play and have a good fun you know ha have a good time but are also playing well playing win and it makes the it just adds so much to it, right? And Battlehaven has that potential, in my opinion, to deliver not only just a great gaming experience, but a great event experience. Oh, those are those are good people. I mean, their they're, their heart is in the right place of putting together a real fun event. It's always nice when we get to, to get uh, to chat with them and chat about the event. I just got me thinking, like that would be. That way, I don't know the size and what the capabilities are, but that is an environment to where a tournament that just reported hobby scores would seem would, would not seem out of place at all. Absolutely, no. And, and based on my experience going there the last couple of years, you're going to you're going to see armies that will compete for that sort of thing. Yes, that's great. I know we're rambling on a little bit, and we got that segment coming up after us, the Sword of Ice and Fire board Song game. Song of Ice and Fire? Song about, yep, Song of Ice and Fire board game. Uh, this is, it, it's a, you could pretty much take it right off the shelf and play with it. And that, that has a lot of, that, that has a lot to say about it, I guess. Yeah. Uh, well, so I'll leave that for, for Michael to, to cover. Uh, he does it much more better than I do. But I am interested in knowing more about this game, uh, you know, especially as in, as enthusiasm will start to ramp back up again as the 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 idea of books coming out and shows coming back on and 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 that kind of stuff. Just as people get their 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 idea of it, and it, and it is a rank and file based fighting game or miniature game. Now, there are a ton of people who really prefer that sort of thing. Yeah, it's just weird. they they, they want to have that tray tray movement style game, and yeah, I. You know, I play a couple of games with it. My my favorite version of Lord of the Rings Rules actually uses that, and I think it's one of the best and most functional See? fantasy games I've ever played. All right, man. Okay, maybe it is now, but whenever someone would have their their five long, five wide, uh, twenty rank deep, you know, something rats, uh, skeletons, 
pikemen or whatever, and I just come in there and bust it up with like three chaos knights, and you got you got to put all those 120 models back in the box. Listen, I, I I'm talking Lord of the Rings right now. All right, let it's me, a let me little, do it. It's a little so different. I got my Drukar orc and my war riders, and you've got your your um, your Shire folk on their march to. Listen, if I'm going to war with Shire folk, the game's already lost. <laughs> All right, just get get mm, get your example game going, man. <laughs> I, I, you have to do a dart in or whatever they're called. You got some men. Uh, <laughs> oh, it hurts. That are trotting. Guys, someone save me. <laughs> they're trotting uh, through the the swamps of Minas Tirith. Uh, All in single file line. And this is like one of those memes where you see like Gandalf, but it's like you're a wizard, Luke. <laughs> and then some like, eagles who yeah. inexplicably just drop me off about a mile away from where I actually need to be. <laughs> hey, gotta, man. Then I got to trot on over there. And you're st- for some reason, but you're respect still- them eagles, man. If you do not, I, let me tell you this right now. Full stop. You do not respect the eagles. They will not respect you. <laughs> is that it? They just didn't respect Gandalf. Hey man, they they aren't they aren't horses, man. The eagles are a noble race, all right. The messengers of the gods, they don't they don't have to take no guff from anybody, especially no Paul Murphy Just talking miles. about the swamps of Minas Tirith. You don't think there's any swamps around Minas Tirith? No, Minas Tirith is not a pretty swamp. Sure, pretty country. sure there is some swamps around Minas Tirith. Uh, nope. I'm pretty sure there is. Nope. Man, after the show, if I pull up a map and there's swamps next to Minas Tirith, mm, the reckoning. I mean, if if you want to talk about the dead marshes, that's you know that's not that's not like a swamp to you? but it's there. All right. Anyway, let's let's wrap this up and then we'll get uh, to the next segment with Cole Mini or not. Chris, I appreciate you rambling on with me for a uh, good part of the show here. Oh man, that was fun, especially where I got to give you crap about losing to Val and blaming the cards. <laughs> yeah, uh, I let people know. I told him I was going to let people know he won. So yep. I've done my job. He did. Pat on the bum. Good job, buddy. I've done my job. <laughs> All right. Well, hang tight. Oh, and we're going to bring this interview with Cole Meaner or not, and then we'll see everybody else next week. Yeah, cheers, man. See ya. FTN is brought to you by Bell of Lost Souls. Check out www.bols.org for the best daily hobby articles on the web. Hey, everybody. Welcome to a special segment of Forge the Narrative. My name is Paul Murphy, your host. I'm joined today by Michael Chanel. Hello, Paul. Hey, man. How you doing? Doing pretty good here. I mean, you know how it's like here in Georgia. The weather has been fluxing up and down. So it's been dealing all with that. over the place. My uh, AC system didn't know what to do. A couple days ago, the heat was on. Now the AC's back on. Yep, it's been great. Another day in Georgia. <laughs> Global warming is fake. <laughs> well, I think people uh, don't all always know that, but like, Simon is in Atlanta. I basically right in my backyard. Been here forever. Yep. So our, uh, our U.S. Uh, office is located just right here in Alpharetta. We're here to talk about, we've had you on before, we're here to talk about your song of, of Ice and Fire miniature-based strategy game. Yep. It's full-on tabletop war, set in that world, set in the books. Uh, not the not uh, anything associated with the TV show, uh, but it uh, based off of the, the books. Yep, this is fully based on the books. We worked with George R. R. Martin to bring the uh, his world to life. So everything that we do... All the art assets, all the unit concepts, all of that is run through him to make sure that they are uh, fitting with his vision. The way I like to describe it is, you know, we're playing in someone else's uh, playground, so we got to obey by their rules. But we're doing the best we can to bring all of his characters to life in the way that he envisioned them. Well, you so- can't go wrong with going with his with that source material. I mean, from the man himself, right? Yep, that's right. <laughs> and he's also a, a, a war gamer, like or at least a miniature collector, from what I understand. Oh yeah, he uh, so one of the uh, the basements of one of his houses um, <laughs> is wall to wall just miniatures. You can go on YouTube, and there's several uh, little video snippets of him completely geeking out about just his painted miniatures that he has for display there. And he actually, to my understanding, is an old school like historic gamer. Man, that'd be awesome. If you put in a good word uh, for me with him, maybe get him on the show to talk about that. That'd be awesome. Oh, yeah, you know, just to hit him on the speed dial we got here. <laughs> hey, I don't know. I, look, you might need that kind of connection to get this uh, stuff because, I mean, I, the figures have been out, or at least uh, the uh, the sculpts have been shown for this game. Well, we actually have, like, the full uh, production plastics. We were actually at Adepticon a few weeks ago. We had the... Um, full prototypes for our starter boxes with the final print run uh, miniatures and everything in their full plastics that we were demoing with. They look awesome. I mean, things like, I mean, like, for instance, I know we talked about the mountain before, but all the characters fully brought to life. Uh, 
and you know, and, I mean, can, can you talk about them? I know, and uh, we've gushed about the mountain before because he's just such an epic character in size, uh, you know, and in renown. Uh, but what are some of the other ones that maybe people have not seen uh, re- up close that you can talk about right now? Well, so you know, pretty much all the major characters we have, you know, they they'll appear in the game with different versions as well. So, for example, we have Jamie Lannister. Uh, we the starter box comes with his Kingslayer version. At uh, Depticon, we actually previewed a resin of his Kingsguard version. And in the Kickstarter, you're actually getting a version of him as a the maimed captive. So him with uh, after his spoilers for you know decade old book when he got his hand uh, cut off. <laughs> Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the rules of the game and how how the interaction between players would work? How, what's the scale? How many figures is a, what would you call, now I don't mean like a starter force, but like when someone uh, builds what would will be their their organized play force, how many figures are they looking like, are looking at? And then how does that interaction work on the table? So each one of the units of infantry is composed of 12 models. All the cavalry are four models. And then you have other units that might be solo if they're like a larger size or things like that. But those are going to be your standard sizes. Now, the the big push for us here is that when we're making the starter box, it is a starter box, but we want this to be complete game experience right off the bat. So we have three suggested game sizes, and that's 30 points, 40 points, and 50 points. But you can scale up as much as you want. We played 100 point games and it works out just fine. But the point being is that the starter box is actually going to give you around between 34 to 36 points for each of the two factions in it, the Starks and the Lannisters. So you're actually going to be able to play a standard, like a small size game uh, of 30 points and still have variety in the box to customize out your force. So you're not going to be just uh, shoehorned into playing the same thing. You actually have variety of what you can take just in that box. And frankly, the starter box plus. Uh, one other unit box of whatever you want to buy for your chosen army is going to give you enough to play a what we would call a standard size game. So, yeah, so if I remember right, you said unit box. Like the, when this is going to be a retail product. It's not just a kick, Kickstarter exclusive type thing. It's going to be on the shelves. And when someone wants to buy a unit, they do. They just buy that box, and the whole unit is in that box. Yeah, the, already uh, assembled, right? Exactly. Each of the so the, the models are all pre-assembled. They're not one-piece sculpts. It's a very big difference there. They're pre-assembled. Uh, the bodies are PVC plastic. All the weapons and all the anything that can be finley or breakable is, is PVC plastic. And again, we've got pictures of those in really good detail up on the Kickstarter, showing them both you know highlighted and out in the wild at Adepticon. And then you know you can see the first-hand reports there to show. These are probably some of the best sculpts and miniature quality that we have put out as a company because you know we're always trying to improve on our board games and everything. But, you know, we had to take this to another level because the people are set to a different standard. Things that, pe- that people will want to paint these and oh, yeah. and make scenes and dioramas and stuff. Like, the, the miniatures are that good. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, you're getting a movement tray that comes in each box. All the bases are textured and everything. Um, but the other nice thing is that because all the units are pre-assembled and everything, if you go to a store and you see, like, man, those are uh, the mountains men. They look really bad. I want to play with them. You can just buy that box, open the box up, and boom, you're ready to play. You just put them on your tray, and you're ready to go. You know, as long as as fast as it takes you to unbox it and then put them on the tray, you're ready to play. How are the uh, the rules going to be? Are they each in their own faction book? Uh, is it is it a collection of uh, of the factions all in one book? I mean, ha- what's the, the entry rule- here for people to get? The rule book that comes in the starter box is your full rules. It's around 40 pages with full diagrams. For everything and a ton of examples because we didn't want any ambiguity. But between the rules and the unit cards, every starter box file that comes with two reference cards, which, well, sorry, two copies of the reference card. The reference card is a front and back tarot sized card that basically um, is the compact version of all of the rules. Okay. That combined mm-hmm. with, the, with the unit cards is every single thing you need to play because all the rules are fully printed on all the cards. There's no referencing anywhere else. So that's it. Between the reference card and your unit cards that you have for your, well, your actual units, that's it. If you have, do, those, do those come with the units or do you have to purchase yes, them separately? Absolutely. They come with every box. So, you know, your starter, you know, every unit has its own unit card uh, for reference. And yes, that comes with every single unit box you purchase. Starter box comes with, you know, one for everything. That's every, that's, that's fully it. There's no, you know, there's no codices or army books or anything to buy. It's fully within that. And I, and I might have missed this a, co- uh, a couple of minutes ago, but how many figures is that 36, 34 point army? Uh, so each of these, each of these, st- the starter box comes with four units per side. So the Stark side, you're going to get three units of infantry. So 36 models there, plus one unit of cavalry, uh, another four models, and then one gray wind, uh, the dire wolf who's on his own. So that's going to be, um, on the Stark side of things, 
for a small size army, if you're just talking just straight up models, in that case, you're going to be looking uh, somewhere around 40 or so. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think that's uh, that's a really good size. What's the suggested tabletop size to be played in this on? 40 points is our standard size game. So basically take that, add another unit of another 12 guys, and then another individual character or whatnot, which range anywhere between 3 to 5 points, and you're set. So for a standard size game, you're looking around 60 models or so spread across between 4 to 6 movement trays. Uh, not not bad at all. And is this you mentioned in the pre-show? I don't know if we covered this yet, but along with the release of the game, you will be recently releasing in tandem uh, match play rules. Yeah. So organized play is a big push uh, for us as well because you know that's an important thing for any miniatures game, at least we feel. So from day one, you're going to have organized play. Uh, we actually have released the contents of the organized play kit that will be coming out with this, and basically you're going to get some deluxe activation tokens in the form of house banners. So in this case, it'll be Stark and Lannister. And then also we have some alternate sculpt Roos Bolton mercenary, or sorry, neutral faction model and cards. And basically the neutrals in the game can be hired by most every faction. You're going to get some alternate sculpts of him, and he is going to be released in a retail item. That's the one thing is that there's never going to be any exclusive content for the game. Anything that's given away in organized play is either just going to be bling, like the like the activation banners, or an alternate sculpt of something that is widely available in the case of Roos Bolton. Gotcha. So, um, yeah, from day one, you can go to your local game store, say, hey, I want to play in, or, uh, if, in an organized play event, assuming they've set one up, which, you know, that's something that the players, you know, need to bug their store about if they haven't, because why not? You just play in the events and you get some cool stuff. And then it's really up to the store to divvy out how they want to handle the uh, exclusive sculpts, whether they want to make that, you know, a mini tournament and prize or, you know, some other way to hand that out. And is that is that organized play? What That's the 40 points that, that this suggested. Oh, the organized play can be fully handled by the store of however many points they want to run. Uh, because this one is being released in tandem with the starter box, I assume most of those events are probably going to be at 30 points, so people can you know run the starter box contents right out of there. I got it. And, and do you play this on a 4x6 table? Is this on a 4x4? Four four? Like, what's, what's the suggestion? It's played on a suggested 4x4 four four with the uh, option to move up to a 4x6 if you're playing a larger size game. But frankly... A 4x4 four four works for most any of the standard sizes you're going to play. Really, a 4x6 is going to work if you're going to play something like, you know, uh, 70 points or more. You almost double what the standard size is. Then I would move to a 4x6. Okay. Well, that, that's, that's good. What what uh, what factor does terrain and, and things of that nature play? Because I think you have some terrain along with this game. Is that right? Oh, in the starter box, you are getting a, a metric on a terrain, to be honest. So this is a, a larger size box than our standard board games. For those who are familiar with those, this is almost uh, twice the... Uh, the length of it, and you're getting three punch boards worth of tokens and terrain in here. We definitely want you to have um, more options than than fewer when it came to this. So terrain is very important in the game because you know this is a positioning rank and file miniature game. Though you know terrain is one of those things that really affects the battlefield, and it is super important to you know have a diverse collection of those. So you are actually getting a large amount in the starter box, and actually, Paul, here, if you'll give me just one second, I can tell you the exact amount if I just pull that file up here. Uh, but you're getting a diverse thing uh, of range of options, ranging from like stakes, corpse piles, weirwood trees, uh, forests, uh, bogs. The corpse piles, uh, all right. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's actually one of the scenarios in the game specifically revolves around the corpse piles that every time a unit of infantry dies, they basically get turned into a corpse pile. And the more of those you're near, uh, it starts breaking down your morale that you have in your army. Th- that's, all right. That's neat. So uh, total in the starter box, you're getting... Uh, 13 double-sided terrain pieces. You're getting four corpse piles, one forest, one bog, one weirwood tree, uh, three double-sided stakes slash hedges. And, and these one... are flat cardboard tiles. Yes, these are flat two, right? uh, two. These are flat 2D pieces. During the Kickstarter, we offered 3D versions. And actually, if any of your stores out there back to the Kickstarter and a retail pledge level, they have access to any of this stuff as well. So they can go and, and buy this as well. And we also showed. A lot of this uh, 3D terrain on our Kickstarter, and then also from Adepticon as well. So there's pictures of that out there. D- does the uh, is there ever a line of sight like blocking factor here? Do will will, will someone only need the 2D terrain, or will they need to eventually upgrade to the 3D terrain? No. So every all the line of sight rules are handled via a keyword system on the terrain. So for example, um, your palisades they have the blocks line of sight keyword. So if you try to, you know, measure line of sight through them, then it's going to be, uh, you know, you can't do that. I get you. All, okay. the, all the line of sight method is done. Uh, basically, if you look at it from a top-down uh, topographical standpoint, there's no true line of sight or anything like that. 
uh, units block line of sight, certain terrain pieces block line of sight when you're trying to measure. So there's never going to be any arguments with players. You know, that's very clearly defined how that all works because uh, true line of sight is one of those things that, you know, you you remember, Paul, back from, well, I guess, your current 40K days and those days when you used to be in team tournaments and everything, how, uh, you know, how that can get. <laughs> well, it's as long as, you know, there's a way of handling. I'm just curious as to how the, how the game played out. And, you know, 2D terrain, it's easy to switch out the tabletops, that's for sure. Yep. And the thing is, so a lot of our terrain also, um, because of the nature of it, if you have the 3D version, for example, we have uh, we have stakes. So those have the destructible keyword. So if a unit moves over them, they actually are destroyed and removed from the battlefield, and the, the unit that moves on top is going to suffer some negative effects. But you do have like terrain that can actually like shape get shaped across the battlefield. Uh, one of the game modes is actually a siege scenario. It's the um, Storm of Swords game mode, where you have a defender who is defending their castle, and you have three big castle wall terrain pieces. And so that game mode is all about one person's the attacker, one person's the defender, the defender is just trying to last six rounds to outlast the attacker's onslaught before their uh, their uh, battlements are destroyed. And are these things that are 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 like su- suggested tournament type missions, or is these just are, are more for narrative uh, or play replicating battles in the books? So we have five different uh, game modes that are included in the game uh, for our tournament system and everything. It's basically recommended that. You can play uh, any of them that you want, and they're also all functioning uh, functional for multiplayer as well, except for the uh, the Storm of Swords one I just mentioned. That one's better off two player, but all the others can be played with multiple players if you so choose. And we will have a full like you know tournament rule kit and everything that will come out shortly after release as well. I like the sound of that. Uh, so all the factions, what are the various factions that people get can get on day one? On day one, we have the Starks and Lannisters. Those are our two initial factions. Um, those are the ones that we also introduced in the Kickstarter. And then we have the neutral forces, which currently are represented by House Bolton, uh, also in the Kickstarter. The thing about the Kickstarter that was different from a lot of the ones we did is that we, again, from day one, wanted this game to have a big retail push. So the Kickstarter was a very limited amount of offering. You know, we wanted, you know, we want you, here's the, the foundation of this game. Everything else is supported through retail. So you're going to need to get through your retail stores. But we do have plans that within the first, um, the first, you know, three months of the game being released in retail, you're already going to see new factions. Now we haven't really talked about them too much. We've been dropping some spoilers here and there with, you know, a few various art pieces and a few miniatures that we've been showing across conventions, but we haven't said anything. So, you know, I'm not going to break that just yet and say anything, but, Again, we have two more factions scheduled to be released almost immediately after launch. And the so. reason I ask is, you know, this is one of the this is one of the properties that people can get uh, emotional attached to certain factions and families. Uh, just curious as to when they'll be represented. Well, I mean, the number one question since uh, hell day negative one was, you know, oh, when are we going to see dragons? <laughs> and I, I, I swear we could have, uh, we could have funded the next three books being written if I had a dollar for every time I was asked that. <laughs> but uh, as we have kind of adapted our motto, if it's in the books, it can be in the game. And I will just say that, you know, it is a fairly safe bet to think that probably the most iconic aspect of the entire series is probably going to work its way into the game somehow. Well, oh, sure. Yeah, and I can imagine <laughs> that there would also be special scenarios around that kind of stuff. But but I think at the core of, of what the game is, if I'm picking up what you're putting down, is that it's a it's a battle. It's an army fighting an army. Yes, and that's one of the things that people always ask, well, you know, how are you going to handle full-size grown-up dragons? And I will answer that by saying uh, the same way that armies handle them in the books. <laughs> not <is> not well. <laughs> 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 not well. No, I, no I'm, I'm kidding, of course. So, but, uh, well, that's the thing. Like again, you you're basically asking, you know, okay, well, what do I do against an atom bomb? You're right. What what do you do against an atom bomb? <laughs> I, I don't <laughs> want to put the, the the cart before the horse. I mean, I think that I think that the game uh, has a good bit uh, of of interesting sure. things just with this this level of uh, I guess unit on unit type combat. Mm-hmm. So I mean, again, it, uh, we we it, might have uh, jumped over it too, but like, ha- how does the game work? How how does one deploy their forces? How do you how do you defeat your opponent? Like, what what are the what are the core mechanics here? All right. So as I had said previously, we have five different game modes, and each of those are going to lay out your victory conditions. So it's never going to be a matter of just going in there and killing all your opponent's guys. That's going to help you win the game, but it's not going to be how you win the game. Uh, each of the game modes outlays different victory conditions, but. Basically, you're going to have your units. You'll deploy them based on the game mode that you're playing uh, in various configurations. Usually it's going to be, you know, somewhere on my side of the table, and then you have your deployment area, and they're going to start moving around the board. 
you know, again, this is it's rank and file stuff. I mean, I'm not going to say that's anything, you know, uh, new or, you know, innovative. Uh, it's just it is what it is. But the big thing is that, you know, so you got your units and everything is actually based on the remaining ranks in your units. Uh, each infantry unit has three ranks consisting of four models each. And so while the individual models in a unit uh, comprise the health of the unit, as you start losing ranks, your effectiveness in the unit is going to start deteriorating. So if you have three ranks, you know, your attack is going to be the strongest it can be. When you get knocked down to two ranks, then it's going to be a little bit weaker. When you get knocked down to one rank, it's going to be, you know, your unit's almost broken and almost going to flee. So, you know, it's um, not going to be playing that well. While this is all going on, you have a, a deck of tactics that is unique to your uh, faction. It is also modified by your army commander, which is a, a powerful individual that you have chosen to lead your forces. And I say powerful not in necessarily the physical sense, because in the setting, you know, okay, you've got the mountain. He's a big scary guy. He can probably kill like four or five guys on his own, but if a, ten guys come after him, they're just going to kill him. You know, people are not that resilient. This is not uh, this is not hero hammer, for lack of a better word. Um, so you're taking your commander for their strategy and tactics. And so they're going to modify your tactics deck by putting in some of their own special cards. So each of your turns, you'll have a number of uh, cards in your hand that are basically the tactics that your army uh, employs, not just your commander, but also your chosen faction. So you've got your unit abilities that are going on. So, you know, I might have a unit that's really fast, very skirmishy, but doesn't have a lot of armor. I might have a big tanky unit, you know, your standard tropes and things like that. Uh, but on top of that, I've got my tactics cards coming from my commander and my overall army, which is going to change how I play. Just by switching out my commander, it can drastically change how my army plays, even if I'm playing the exact same units. For example, if I have the Starks, and I've got an army that is led by Rob Stark. So he is all about mobility, positioning, doing flanking tactics, hit-and-run type of stuff. Uh, that army is going to play very differently than one run by, say, Great John Umber, who is the leader of House Umber, and these are all the, the grizzly kind of mountain men style guys. They're all about berserker tactics, so they're going to get stronger as they take damage. So even if I just take the same exact units and I switch out my commanders, the different tactics cards that those are going to configure my deck into are going to change how my army plays, because one of them is going to be very swift, it's going to be very maneuverable. The other one is going to be not as swift, not as maneuverable, but if you damage them, they're going to damage you back, and they're probably going to end up getting stronger as they suffer damage. And so while all that is going on, you also have the tactics board, and that represents the off-battlefield political nature of the game and the setting in general, because that was one of the most important aspects of, you know, just the books. You know, more people die off battlefield than they do combined on the battlefield by the uh, by the books. I gotcha. And is that how you handle more of the the, the characters that have what, what what I would consider no combat potential? Exactly. So you have a tactics board off to the side of the battlefield, and so I should mention the game is alternating activations. I'm going to pick a unit and activate. You're going to pick a unit and activate, and we're going to go back and forth in, in the round until everything is done. Part of the units that I can buy in my army are my non-combat characters. It's like Cersei Lannister or, you know, Sansa and uh, Caitlyn Stark. Uh, there are also some non-combat versions of combat characters. Like Ned Stark has a combat version. He's got a non-combat version. But as part of my activations, these guys can move on to the tactics board. And there's five different zones that they can vie for control over. And for controlling these zones, they're going to give me beneficial effects. They're going to affect the flow of combat, whether that ranges from healing up my uh, my combat units via hiring on reinforcements or, you know, causing panic in enemy forces via, uh, you know, intimidation tactics or things like that, or even allowing me to um, draw additional tactics cards and things as, you know, they're doing strategic planning. In addition to this, all those non-combat guys will have additional powers of their own that might influence the battlefield as well. So, for example, um, Cersei. Uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll use one of my favorite examples. So Tyrion, uh, for taking him in my army, he is going to increase my tactics hand size because he's way smarter than you, right? Um, and he also has a certain number of times per game he can force your opponent to start discarding their tactics cards. Oh, okay. And then you've got guys like Varus. Uh, Varus has the ability to actually, sh he's basically like a counterspell. He starts shutting down enemy tactics and political effects. So you take him if, you know, you just want to run a control style army. Okay, so I, I'm starting to see how this call plays out, how you, your commander is uh, uh, gives character and personality to your army, uh, even above beyond what they have, like, on the, the sculpted on the figure and whatnot. Right. Okay. I like it. So, um, with the deck itself, is that something that you construct, uh, or is it you just get the, the deck for the faction? How How your is this modular? 
your deck is consisting of uh, 14 faction-specific cards, uh, seven cards with two du duplicates, and then it's adding six cards into your deck based on the commander you've chosen. So uh, if I'm running, you know, uh, Ned Stark, he's going to give me three cards with two copies each that are shuffled into that deck. So the commander that you choose is making up a full third of your overall army tactics. So flipping the other side of the coin here, let's look at the Lannisters. If I take Jamie Lannister as my commander, that army is going to be very focused on counterattacks and basically punishing the opponent for uh, failing in what they're going to do. So he's got, you know, Deadly Riposte, Expert Parry, all these things are going to help you survive attacks and then deal extra damage on the counterattack. If I switch out Jamie for the Mountain, all of a sudden my army is going to become much more focused on charging and overrunning the enemy and just raw, more raw aggression. So those can, that right there is just showing a really quick change just by switching out your commander, you know, how you're going to have a completely different play style, even in the same faction. Uh, that, that's kind of neat. So the game is, we, we keep saying it's coming out soon, uh, but when can people expect to get this in their hands and it start to be, uh, appear on the shelves at retail stores? Uh, August is when we're looking right now. Uh, that's when the, the, you'll be able to go pick it up and, you know, start playing. To be fair, I think that's a slight delay from the last time we talked. Yeah, so when our Kickstarter, our, our estimated projection was April. Unfortunately, we had a delay that set us back some time, and our current projections are in August. But we're, you know, we're fairly confident that that's going to be hit. Well, what's the website that people can find this? Uh, that'll be on our Kickstarter. If you look there under, just look up Song of, Song of Ice and Fire on Kickstarter, or you can check us out on Facebook as well, Song of Ice and Fire Tabletop Miniature Game. And then what is the expect expected retail price for the game if someone has it already in on the Kickstarter right now? The starter box for Stark versus Lannisters is one uh, 150. That's getting you two armies and a hundred and three miniatures total. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I hope it's okay if I check back with back in with you as this starts to come out, and uh, especially when you get your uh, organized play pack and something we can talk about. And even the stuff I can't talk about right now, <laughs> I just really want to talk about. But you know, soon, we can definitely soon. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how it progresses, man. Yep. Well, actually, we can probably get some uh, live plays in there, uh, Mr. Murphy, if you want. I mean, again, we're both down the street from each other. That would be neat. I mean, I would love to. This is uh, with the with. I mean, this is a very popular style of moving miniatures around, uh, and and I think I think it's uh, it's a different level of tactics, and uh, love to exercise that brain with that or that part of the brain uh, with this uh, you know really cool story behind it. Well, you know, I've always liked to rank and file miniature games. You know, I'm an old school you know Warhammer player, but the whole point of this one here was just we wanted to kind of modernize it a bit because, you know, the old style rank and files, you know, not even just talking about Warhammer, but just the old historical ones and things like that. Um, you know, it's just a natural uh, progression of, you know, uh, people's time these days. Because, for example, one of the big things is that each of these games, even if you're playing a larger size game, it's going to probably take you about an hour or less. Um, but that was a very important thing because, yeah, you remember the old days, you know, you could be playing for three, four plus hours on these and still not really be done. The whole night. And just no one has I don't mind that. that either though. I don't, you know, there's, yeah, I like all kind of, I like yes. all types. Yes. But it's, I would much rather get a few good games in than just one okay game or even one decent game to be honest. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I had not even thought to ask just how long it, it would take to play a full game. Yeah. You know, it's, it's actually one of those things that it's, it's actually a pretty big point to bring up the fact that the game does move very quickly uh, and it's just, you know, it's that expectation that people have when they hear, you know, oh, rank and file or even tabletop miniature games these days. They just think that I have to devote a couple hour block at minimal to this. And that's just not the case here. Um, you know, the first time you're playing through, yeah, it might take you a couple hours because you're getting rules and everything. But I'm really I'm fully confident if you you and your opponent both know what you're doing, you can complete any of these game modes with a standard size game in an hour or less. Man, that's pretty cool. Well, Michael, thanks a lot for coming on and talking with me. And uh, I will be uh, trying to catch up with you very soon, either to get my hands on and play the game uh, or to uh, to get you back on and talk about things as we get closer to the launch. All right, Paul. As always, it's a pleasure. Have a good night. Yep. Take care, man.